I know you had a question earlier, and perhaps you want to follow up. Uh, what we might do is take 15 minutes of questioning now, because I realize I put a lot on the table, uh, and then I'll have 15 minutes to lecture some more before we're done. Does that sound like a good approach? Yes. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's take some questions. Let's take some questions on what we've said. Um, yes. Two questions. Yes. Uh, so first of all, I love the idea of uh, pre prevenient. Prevenient grace. Yes, it's wonderful. I, I love prevenient grace too. And I, I, I see that, and I think it's true. Do you have any scripture that says something about it? The main text that Wesley uses in terms of prevenient grace is actually John. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, that light uh, that enlightens all humanity was coming into the world. Uh, and so that's a reference to Christ and Christ being the light. And a light that uh, illumines uh, you know, all humanity. So that's one place where uh, we clearly see uh, the reference uh, to provenient grace. The reference to provenient grace. Um, let me share something on that point before you ask your second question, because your question here, your first one, reminds me of the importance of prevenient grace and, and how this is going to make the, the Methodist tradition uh, maybe different than other theological traditions. And I think this is in, shows Wesleyan theology as very generous. It's very generous. So let me tell you a story, true story. Uh, I had a nun friend. She has since died. A nun friend. I have all sorts of friends, good friends. Uh, and she said to me, Ken, you have to read this book. So I said, OK, sister, why do I have to read this book? Well, because she knew I was a Wesleyan and she knew my theology. She said, well, you know, this Christian uh, it wrote a whole book, and they, they are trashing 12-step programs. They're, sa they're saying, basically, 12-step programs are evil. They're of the devil because why? They don't specifically mention and focus on Jesus Christ. So they said, okay, 12-step mm, programs are bad. Now, she is a Roman Catholic, and I, as a Methodist, uh, we don't, accept that theology, okay, because both our traditions have an understanding of provenient grace. That 12-step that programs, for example, would represent the grace of God, the provenient grace of God manifested. And provenient grace is Christologically based, John 1.9 and, and elsewhere, whether that is recognized or not. Okay, uh, but you know, in my theology, I know wherever bondages are broken, God has done the work, whether God is acknowledged or not. So I would argue then that Methodist or Wesleyan theology is generous. We can acknowledge good wherever it is, whether it's inside the church or outside the church. We can acknowledge the good that's in a 12-step program because why? That represents the provenient grace of God working through those means. Or you talk about the love of a father or a mother for a child uh, who, is an, who says they're an atheist, okay? That too would represent the provenient grace of God in which they are participating even though they don't acknowledge. Okay, ask your second question. Yes, quietism or stillness, yes. Yes, but then there's a scripture in, uh, in Romans 10.30 and also in Job 2.32 in English. Uh, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So they, not, they do, not, do not accept that scripture? Or how, do they, how can they have a theology like this? In other words, how could they have the theology of quietism or stillness in light of calling on the name of the Lord being saved? Yeah, I mean, I think there are so many problems with this theology, the theology of quietism and stillness. 
and you're assuming that it's coherent, a coherent theology, you, you see, but I don't assume that because I think this theology um, has grave problems, has many problems with it, uh, and does not accurately represent the theology we see uh, arising from scripture, from the Bible, and, and you are being aware of that. Yeah, so that's good. Other questions, comments? Uh, other questions, comments? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So you, you, you were telling us that um, Wesley did a big emphasis on the moral law yes. as um, yep. a means or I don't know, it, has, it was useful for um, leading to some of the repentance. But um, what, uh, what connection did he do with, um, did he make any connection with the Old Testament? How would he connect the moral law and the Old Testament law? Because for me it's all different. Yes, for, for John Wesley, uh, there is continuity between the moral law given at Sinai and then the moral law that is expressed by Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. And so Wesley would see the moral law uh, as continuous as going through salvation history. Uh, and indeed, in the wake of sin and the fall, uh, we see an initial restoration of the moral law through provenient grace in all people. Then Wesley argues we see a more particular formal restoration with the giving of the law to the Jews, okay, at Sinai. And then Wesley talks about, uh, in his sermon, the original nature, property, and uses of the law, uh, how its greatest expression will be found in the Sermon on the Mount. So the moral law is continuous because the moral law is a copy of the divine mind. Uh, in that sense, uh, it doesn't change. It's an expression uh, of the divine will and of who God is. And so, yes, there will be continuity between the expression of the moral law in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and then the expression of the moral law in the New Covenant, the New Testament. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Yes. What about sanctification? I heard this word just once. and I, You're going to hear it a lot. Oh, good. Because it <laughs> yeah, seems yeah, like it's like a struggle about getting saved or getting the salvation or having the salvation, but sanctification is like whole life. Yeah. I, mean. I can say some things now, and you can understand this in light of what we have already discussed. So, we talked about the new birth. Remember? We talked about the new birth and regeneration. What's another name for the new birth or regeneration? Well, even though Wesley doesn't use this expression, we can use it. What's another way of talking about the new birth? It, it, that's right. That's exactly right. You're exactly right. It is initial sanctification. Because why? Because we, are becoming, we, are, we become holy. So that's the beginning of holiness. It's initial sanctification. Okay, so we're talking about sanctification in some sense, even with a child of God. Because in Wesley writes in his sermon on Christian perfection, even a child of God is so far perfect as to be free from the power and dominion of sin. So we may forget that sometimes when we talk about entire sanctification and therefore forget that those who are born of God, they are sanctified. They are sanctified. Not entirely so, but initially so, meaning that they're holy. Uh, because why? Because they're born of God, and the Holy Spirit is tabernacling in their heart or in their person. I like that better. Uh, in their person. <laughs> Uh, making them, transforming them, making them holy. So you're right. So where we're headed, and we'll probably get there, I don't know if we'll get there today, but certainly tomorrow, we're going to talk about sanctification in a threefold way. 
We've spoken about it just in one way right now. We, we've talked about initial sanctification or regeneration or the new birth, the beginning of, of holiness. But we're going to talk about other senses of sanctification later on. Yeah, good question. Very good question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yes. Я не совсем поняла, где граница благодати на практике предваряющей. Я так понимаю, когда человек уже нуждается во Христе, вот я хочу стать христианином. Вот для меня это понятие так, что его нужно уже привести к покаянию. А с разговора я так понимаю, что Эсси предлагает еще шаги в предваряющей благодати. I need to ask you about uh, the line of uh, uh, grace. If, uh, if, for example, I want to become a Christian, isn't it enough just to come to get converted to God, or there are still some steps that I definitely need to do, like action deeds to like to do before I come to God, or in order to come to God? So. Is she asking the question, you know, are there any steps or what must be done in order to receive the grace of God? Is that what she's saying? She said that Wesley sort of has these steps. Um, yeah, Wesley is, is sort of laying out uh, the path or, or an order. You know, it's how we would normally think of a person as they're coming to Christ, that you know, they realize they're a sinner, that they're under conviction. Uh, and then, you know, they want to be free uh, from guilt in their lives and from the power. And maybe they haven't received the Holy Spirit in their lives yet. So what should they do in the interim? They should do, you know, works of mercy and charity and the like. So in answer to the question, I think I would have to answer in a sense, yes. For Wesley, there is a kind of flow. You know, we're, we're not trying to be dogmatic here uh, because this process can be very abbreviated for some. In other words, they go from conviction of sin to entering in almost, you know, very quickly, very quickly. But for others, they are, their repentance is belabored and long, long. You see what I'm saying? So there is difference here. There is difference here. Uh, and so we're speaking generally. We're speaking generally in terms of how a person uh, comes to receive the grace of God and be transformed by the grace of God over time. Okay? And, and there, will, there will be differences of how that looks and how it plays out in, in respective persons' lives. So. We're speaking generally, generally, generally here. Um, and, and see, the gentleman over there already pointed out this morning that other theological traditions, they, uh, they view this differently. They view the order differently, okay? Uh, and so it's for illumination. It's for reflection. It's for understanding. Uh, to me, <laughs> but then I'm Wesleyan, so you know, uh, to me this makes sense in my theology, the, the order that Wesley's laying out. Now, to some other Christian who also is a real Christian, this order does not make sense. They see repentance after justification and regeneration. But I, because I affirm the generosity of provenient grace, I see repentance before justification and regeneration. So, you know, what is, what is Wesley trying to do? Getting back to your question again, what's he trying to do? Uh, he's trying to distill scripture, understand it, and apply it the best as he can to the person's life who genuinely wants to know Christ. And so, in a sense, an order of salvation is a human construct, okay? It's an order, it's, a, it's human reflection upon 
what scripture is saying, scripture and tradition and reason and experience in terms of how people come to Christ, okay? So we'd have to understand it in that sense. Now, did we lose the Russian translator? No, it's just because Marina asked me if I can translate from here. Okay, okay. Oh, yes, I see, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Okay. D d do you understand what I'm suggesting here? Okay, good, good, good. I think I have time for one more question before I will lecture for 15 minutes and you get it. Uh, I'm on channel 11. Fifteen. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah. <coughs> yes, I mean, a person receives eternal life uh, in the reception of the forgiveness of sins and, and the renewal of their nature. Uh, and so Wesley is very focused on that because eternal life is in the present. It's in the present because it is knowing God uh, intimately in this way by faith in Jesus Christ. So we experience eternal life in the present and that has ongoing consequences, ongoing consequences for the future, okay? So in answer to your question, you know, when does eternal life begin? In a real sense, it begins with those two key doctrines of justification and regeneration, the reception of the forgiveness of sins, and then the renewal of our nature when the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts. In that sense, eternal life begins. It begins now. Salvation is a present experience, and it will have future consequences. Okay, We will know, love, and enjoy God for all eternity. Good question. Okay, I'm going to use my last 15 minutes and we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about faith, saving faith. Uh, you will recall from the historical part of the course uh, that in 1725, Wesley wrote to his mother uh, that faith is a species of belief and belief is defined as an assent to a proposition upon rational grounds. Faith must necessarily at length be resolved into reason. So you'll recall that. We said that earlier. We said that the other day, that Wesley had a limited understanding of what faith is in 1725, okay? But later on, Wesley came to a, a mature understanding of faith that included not only a divine evidence, but also a conviction that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. But also, even beyond that, that Christ loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, and so Wesley understands faith as both intellectual assent and also as a disposition of the heart, okay? Intellectual assent and a disposition of the heart. And so you'll recall from Wesley's Aldersgate experience, uh, he used the language, I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. 
uh, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Now, if we look at Wesley's sermon, Justification by Faith, he obviously has some important things to say there about the nature of saving faith. And listen to what Wesley writes there. Listen to what Wesley writes. This is important, uh, especially for the exam. Oh, now I have your attention. Okay, <laughs> now I've got your attention. Okay, quote, faith is the necessary condition of justification. Faith is the necessary, necessary condition of justification. Yea, and the only necessary condition thereof. It is the only thing without which no one is justified, the only thing that is immediately, indispensably, absolutely requisite in order to pardon. Okay. So what's Wesley saying there? That faith, faith is the necessary condition and the only necessary condition. You see, you know, one may have very little time, uh, it, you know, and so we cannot talk about repentance and works meet for repentance as absolutely required. No, they are only in some sense. But faith is the necessary and the only necessary condition. Meaning, if faith is not present, we're not justified. We're not justified because it is necessary. It is a necessary condition and the only necessary condition. So then for Wesley, his mature understanding of Christian faith is that faith is not only an assent to the whole gospel of Christ, but also it is a full reliance on the blood of Christ. It is a trust, it is a trust in the merits of his life, his death, and his resurrection, okay? So, what have we talked about? We've talked about two senses of faith there, did we not? Faith as a rational assent, as an assent to a proposition. We talked about that, but then we also talked about faith as a disposition of the heart, belief in uh, it is a reliance on the blood of Christ. It is a trust. Okay, so that's our second sense. It's very relationally understood. But then Wesley talks about faith in a third sense. In a third sense. And here uh, he is writing about faith as a spiritual sense. So, for example, think of the five senses. You know, you have the senses, sight, hearing, taste, etc. Uh, those are senses. They are organs or means through which we receive knowledge. Okay? Wesley talks about faith as a sense. It is a sense by which we discern the things of God. Faith is a means by which we see the invisible world, the world of eternity. Okay? Uh, and so Wesley has this sense, which also is expressed in the book of Hebrews. You know that already. The book of Hebrews talks about faith in this way. Uh, and Wesley is well aware of that. Um, uh, and so Wesley is describing faith uh, in a threefold way. In a threefold way. Okay? Um, uh, so. Now, if we talk about saving faith, uh, and if we start to distinguish justifying faith on the one hand from regenerating faith on the other, uh, we can do that. We can do that. And indeed, Wesley does it. Uh, that justifying faith is a relative change it is the work that God does for us, for us, whereas the new birth or regeneration is a change in being. It is the work that God does 
in us, okay? So we speak of justifying faith as the work, uh, the work that God does for us in forgiving our sins. And we think of regenerating faith as the work that God does in us in restoring uh, our nature, in restoring our nature, okay? And when Wesley is describing justification, when he describes justification, what he means is, what is justification? It is the forgiveness of those sins that are past. He has that little word there at the end, and it has a lot of meaning. It has a lot of meaning. Justification is the forgiveness of those sins that are past past okay so this is the work of God for us what does Wesley mean by that justification is the forgiveness of, of all those sins that are past why did he add that word past suppose Wesley just wrote justification is the forgiveness of sins <coughs> if he wrote that justification is simply is, is simply the forgiveness of sins many people would begin to misunderstand they would say, oh, I'm justified, I am forgiven, and therefore I can go do whatever I want. I can live any way I want, uh, and it's not a problem. And so, by adding that word past, justification is the forgiveness of those sins that are past. Wesley is preventing this misunderstanding of what we call antinomianism, or lawlessness. And there are some antinomian theologies out there today. There are, just as there were in the 18th century, you see. They, they, these theologies leave people in their sins, and they're not troubled. Because they say, oh, oh, God doesn't see their sin. Okay? Well, let me say this. If we can see your sin, surely God can see your sin. Okay? So they have these antinomian understandings that somehow or other justification means we are, we are clothed with a white garment and God doesn't see our ongoing sin uh, and we are justified. No, that's bad theology according to Wesley. Bad theology, that's right, it's bad theology. And Wesley meant to correct it, he meant to correct it. Uh, justification is the forgiveness of those sins that are past. If you break faith with God again, guess what? What's the way forward? Repentance. repentance. That's right, repentance. You have to call, call it what it is. Sin is sin. If you break faith with God, if you do your own sinful will, you say, I'm going my way, I'm going to do it my way, uh, do you want to be restored? Well, then you will have to repent of your sin, okay? You're going to have to acknowledge that it was sin, okay? Uh, that you did it. Uh, other than there's no going forward, okay? So Wesley is arguing justification is the forgiveness of those sins that are past. And that little word past prevents the antinomian misunderstanding that we could be justified in the ongoing practice of sin. We can't. We can't be justified in the ongoing practice of sin. Okay? Um, so, and then Wesley, of course, is talking about not simply justification, uh, but he is also talking about uh, regeneration as well. And let me quote you something from his sermon, The Great Privilege of Those Who Are Born of God. And this is, he's talking about justification and regeneration. This is what he writes, quote, but though it be allowed that justification and the new birth, or initial sanctification, are in point of time inseparable from one another, meaning when you have the one, you have the other. You can't have one without the other. We said that earlier. Yet they are easily distinguished as being not the same, being things of a widely different nature. Justification implies a relative change, the new birth a real change. God in justifying us does 
something for us in begetting us again, Wesley writes, he does the work in us. The one restores us to the favor of God, the other to the image of God. So that although they are joined together in point of time, that is justification and regeneration, joined together in point of time, yet they are wholly distinct natures. They are wholly distinct natures, okay? So, uh, where we are now is we, are, we have defined faith. We've talked about Wesley's threefold understanding of faith in terms of assent, in terms of trust, in terms of a spiritual sense. We've talked about justification. What is justifying faith? And that is the work that God does for us. We talk about justification as the work that God does for us and justifying faith as the reception of that. Okay? Um, and now we've just begun to broach the topic of talking about regeneration. And we've started out by saying that though these works occur simultaneously, justification and regeneration, yet they can be distinguished logically. Okay, the one representing the work that God does for us, the one, the other representing the work that God does in us. Um, and so we'll take a break now, and then after we come back, we will begin to talk about initial sanctification. Amen. amen. We've got an amen corner over here. We'll begin to talk about initial sanctification and the new birth.